and welcome to Potluck, the anything and everything talk and entertainment TV show. I'm your host, Gail Yotis, and today I'm very pleased to have with me Trisha McCauley, nutrition expert. Holistic health counselor Trisha McCauley is a graduate of the Institute for Integrative Nutrition and is certified by the American Association of Drugless Practitioners. Severe food allergies began her exploratory journey with food and cooking almost 20 years ago. Finding alternate foods and learning to cook with brand new staples taught Trisha a great deal about self-care and patience and made her a self-taught expert on dietary transitions. Through her company, Nutrisha Consulting, she helps her clients undertake dietary transitions, learn their way around the kitchen, and discover the foods and truly feed them. Trisha, welcome. Ver welcome to Potluck. Thank you. Um, let me ask you uh, something about your Nutrisha Consulting. Yes. Exactly what does it involve? I work as a holistic nutrition counselor and I see clients uh, one, usually one-on-one. -on -one. We work together in a six-month program so I can help them achieve their health goals. So it's based on diet. We also talk about exercise and relationships and all the other things that make life rich. Um, I also work, I do um, brown bag lunches for law firms and businesses mm -hmm. and I teach classes. I don't always work just one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. So that's what I do. So uh, basically you help people to completely change their diet? Some people completely change their diet. Some people just need nips and tucks and tweaks, um, you know, understanding of what foods feed them. So primarily, I give my clients tools so that they can understand which foods are truly right for them. They become detectives about their own diet. And for some people, that is a lot of sweeping changes. And for some people, that's really just a shift in perhaps a little more vegetables or some whole grains or a different kind of protein. So it's really different for everyone. It's unique. Mm, right, right. Why do you call yourself a holistic health counselor? Because I don't just deal with food. Um, when I was in school at the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, I learned the theory that the founder, jo Joshua Rosenthal, created the theory of primary food and secondary food. Mm, interesting. So secondary food is all the stuff that we eat, the uh, things you actually put in your mouth and chew, and primary food is all the other ways that you can be fed. Mm. So like I said, relationships and spiritual practice, if that's important to you, and social life and your home environment and exercise. So it's looking at the whole person and their whole life because there are a lot of different factors that go into mm. the choices that people make in their diets. Right. So in a way, you're a psychologist. I'm not a trained psychologist. <laughs> um, but, but, but it is. More but like it's more like a life coach dealing with food. Right. It is. There's just a lot of other things, and it's helpful for people, for people to get a perspective right. on why they might need that ice cream every night at 11 uh, or why right, they're addicted right. to Pez, you know, and, and what it represents right. in their life. Right. It's not just a question of being disciplined enough to cut out the sugar because it's right. much more than that. It means different things to different people. Right. So do you have, like... Um, therapy sessions with them? It's not, it's not therapy. I do sit and speak with my clients and they'll tell me how things are going on with them and we'll make recommendations. For instance, and I see them every two weeks. So in the next two weeks, your goal will be to try one new kind of leafy greens and research the gyms in your area, you know, depending on mm -hmm. what their goals are. Mm -hmm. And then they'll come back in two weeks and say, oh, I tried kale, I hated it, mm -hmm. but I tried something else and it was great and I found a gym or I didn't. And mm -hmm. we work to see so that they're not overwhelmed. So you can take the goals so, and create them one thing at a time. Baby steps. Baby steps so that they really mm -hmm. own all the changes that they've made. Because mm -hmm. I could hand anybody this big book on nutrition and everybody right. knows it's there, everybody knows right. all the facts, but it right. becomes overwhelming. Right. So it's, yeah, it's, it's like a hand-holding product. I mean, I'm an advocate right. for my clients. Sort of I'm like father them. confessor. <laughs> Sometimes, <laughs> depending on how many green vegetables they didn't eat. Mm -hmm. No, but it really is about setting goals so that it's not overwhelming, so they can achieve the goals that they want to achieve. Right. It's not about right. my goals for them. Right. It's about what, they, what health goals they want to achieve. And do you find that most of them or many of them are able to follow these steps or, or are there problems? Do they have problems breaking the bad habits, so to speak? It's really different for everybody. For everyone. And it depends on where they are when they come. Some clients are so ready mm -hmm. and it is time and they run with it. Mm -hmm. And some clients, it's a little slower. Mm -hmm. and, some, and, and again, it's just it's completely individual because people have very different goals. 
Right. And so some people right. are disappointed because they hoped to become a whole different person. I don't turn anybody into a different person. Right. I give you new habits. Right. And if it is you're ready to change those habits or to try new things or to just integrate some new stuff, right. it's a great program. Right. So do you have, um, uh, like, what sort of health concerns do your clients usually have? Really runs the gamut. Um, a lot of people just come because they're having some digestive discomfort. Mm. Um, people come because they want to lose weight. Mm. I have a number of clients who are diabetic mm. and want to learn how to manage those levels and how to eat better to improve their health. Right, right. Um, yeah, some people just want to learn to cook for themselves mm. and their families and just stop eating out of vending machines <laughs> and that kind of thing. <laughs> right, right, right. And uh, what typically happens when you meet a client? Well, we would, um, you know, like I said, sit and have our mm -hmm. session, and it's not confession, right. <laughs> it's not therapy, right, but right. discuss what's going on, discuss the issues. So we, the beginning of a six-month program, we set goals, the client sets goals, and we break them down into, where do you want to be a year from now? Right. And where do you want to be six months from now, and what steps can we begin this month to get you on that mm -hmm. track? Mm -hmm. And so... The client does a lot of the talking, mm -hmm. you know, figuring mm -hmm. out where, tell me where they are in their life. Right. And then I will have a topic for each session. So it might be, you know, whole grains. And so I will give handouts and recipes and um, food samples mm -hmm. to help them, mm -hmm. a little starter kit, mm -hmm. so they can go home and work on that mm -hmm. topic. And so the, the topics for each session are, are tailored to each individual client because, mm -hmm. of course, they come in with different Mm -hmm. needs. Well, you, you said that um, you found out that you had a lot of food allergies. Mm -hmm. um, how, did you, how did you find out uh, about your food allergies? It was a long journey. Mm -hmm. I, um, I, would, I started mysteriously swelling up. Mm -hmm. So I would suddenly have this big, my eye would swell up or my lip or a big wow. swell. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was really horrible and no one knew what it was. And <laughs> there was, just very, there was very, at that time very little information about food allergies, right. so I thought, someone said it was spider bites, and I thought, am I allergic to chlorine in the water? I mean, I went through just so many changes. Um, and then I started going to acupuncture, mm. and my acupuncturist had a background in nutrition, and right away she said, mm. give up wheat and corn, and that made a really big difference. Wow. And so that was the first big dietary transition, right. and then, um, over the course of the next couple of years, I use something called the pulse test. It's, um, oh, and I'm forgetting the name of the author. Oh, that's terrible. It's a book called The Pulse Test. Mm -hmm. um, and it is, you can uh, take your pulse mm -hmm. several times a day. So you determine your baseline pulse. And then when you eat a meal, 20 minutes later, you take your pulse again. And if it's gone up, you know that there was an allergen in wow. that meal. So I'd already gotten, ri gotten rid of the gluten and the corn. And I used the pulse test to find uh, garlic and canola oil and, um, wow. what's my other allergy? Soy. Soy? Soy. So oh. it was a big, it's been a big journey. That's a big change. Yeah. I'd die if I couldn't eat soy. Yeah. And I was a vegetarian, I was a vegan for right. a while, so right. I had to go back to eating meat. Really? Well, if you can't eat well, wheat right. or garlic or, or soy, soy you really can't be vegetarian. Yeah. So. Wow. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I know I'm, a, um, I'm not a vegan. I'm a pescatarian, which, you know, I eat fish and yes. seafood, but I don't eat any type of meat. And it must have been difficult because I know that once you train your system not to digest meat, you know, it's hard to, to tra retrain it. Did you have a problem there? I really didn't. I went very slowly. Mm. I went very slowly and I chewed my food. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know that's a big 26 number. times? Yes, <laughs> many times. And, uh, and it was, you know, if I ideally environmentally in the term, terms of sustainability I would love to be a vegan mm -hmm. but and you know but it doesn't work right. for my body and so this right. is also a lesson in there's no one right diet that's right. perfect for everyone for everybody. and so yeah in my practice right. I don't have one diet that oh everybody needs to do right. it's really about learning the foods that sit well in your body and the foods mm -hmm. that give you energy right so each person probably gets a different type of diet from you eventually because I guess they have to work their way through also like you did. Right. They don't get any diet from me. They get right. tools from me tools, and suggestions. Right. And here, let's talk about uh, whole grains. Let's talk about root vegetables. Do they work for you? Mm. Do they make you feel good? Right. Do they, or do they, are they too right. sugary? Are they too, right. then don't put them in, you know, and really finding the balance. Right. And it changes based on the seasons, 
you know, you need to have your foods in the winter because right. your body needs to maintain its, right. uh, its heat and its livelihood right. over the long winter fast and then right. lighter foods in the summer with the seasons and so and depending on the climate where you live your dietary yes, needs are different yes, gender and age and that's so true. it's an ongoing right now experience. this area here you say climate um what what kind of climate would be here and what type of foods would we need i mean i know you have like a cold climate and a hot climate um what what would the difference be well we've got a little of both True, we've got the here, cold winters, yeah. and not you know, it's not like we're in Alaska, but we definitely have a winter. Right. But then in the summer, we have that hot, mm. yes. humid. <laughs> so the idea of you know making sure that you stay hydrated in the humidity and getting enough light right. foods. That right. it really, if you think about the harvest, if you think about you go to the farmers market mm -hmm. and what's there, because mm -hmm. that's going to be local. True, so that's what you true. know. In the spring, we have lots of light greens right. and the berries come out and the sprouts and those sort right. of to help us get off yeah. that winter weight and right. transition into more energy. Right. So it really, and then as, as you know, summer is all that produce, and then we get into the more of the beans and the grains and looking at the soups right, and stews right. through the winter. Right. To keep us keep us warm. Right. And the uh, I mean, like the natives of Alaska eat a lot of whale blubber. Yep. You know, and I mean, basically that's because they need that up there. Exactly. What is it, like 85% protein and fat is their diet? Mm -hmm. And that would kill us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because, well, partially because most of us are not genetically of that stock, right. but also because we don't live in that climate. Right. We would all be having heart attacks. But right. for, if it's the right climate and the right genetic adaptation, it's the perfect diet. Right, and I, I saw a thing on TV a long time ago on Weta, um, and uh, it was this man who went around the world and he finally got to the, he finally got to the, I say utmost place in the world, the farthest end of the world. And it was up in this frigidly cold place, but people actually lived there. And I don't remember the name of the people who lived there. All they ate was, um, some sort of blubber, I forget what animal it was, because they couldn't grow vegetables, they couldn't grow anything, and that was that was their total diet. Yeah. Which I found like, whoa, <laughs> you know. But um, in this area, and what do you think of, and this, is, have, this has become a really big problem all over the country, of the obesity in this country. Why do you, do you have any ideas on how that came to be. I have a number of ideas. <laughs> yes, it's funny you should ask. Yeah, um, well, first of all, we don't move. Our bodies are meant to move around, and we live in oh. a society where we sit. We sit at computers, we sit at yes. desks, we sit. So we don't actually move. So we're having less caloric output, right, right. and then we're eating high sugar, and it's refined sugar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and unhealthy fats, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's not whale blubber, and even if it was, that wouldn't be appropriate for us necessarily, right, but, right. but you know, unhealthy refined right. fats, um, hydrogenated oils, yeah. and corn syrup, oh, high God. fructose corn syrup, and I really, it's not a substance found in nature, and corn is found in nature, obviously, but when you take it and right. add in more fructose, right. it's something that your body does not know what to do with, mm. because it's not found in nature. Right, and fructose is in almost everything. If you read your packages, mm -hmm. you'll see fructose, fructose. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, yeah. Do you think that the entrance of computers has anything to do with our obesity? <laughs> because it seems like... Quite possibly. It's computers. It's um, the way our society is set up where we have to drive everywhere. We can't mm. walk, you know, or it's not necessarily safe for everybody it's to get on a bike yes. and ride here and there, you know. Right. So, so this sort of urban areas versus suburban areas, it's simply that exercise and movement right. are not something that we need to do. Right. You have to have the money and the time to get to the gym or you schedule in your, your evening run. or You know, it's not really right. an integral part of our world. So I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Computers certainly have brought a number of oh. amazing blessings to our culture, yes, so yes. I'm not going to vilify them. But it's, no. it's just been a real gradual change. But it does seem like over the la what last 10 to 20 years, we've started getting bigger and bigger. And um, it's also at the time when people started sitting in front of the internet more and more. Right, there's that, and video games. And I mean, certainly oh, we've had yeah. TV for any number of oh, years. TV, but yeah. That's a big culprit, Yeah, you know. But... Um, so what would you say to people, 
you know, I mean, they have actually had to enlarge seats on planes now to accommodate people. Mm -hmm. Would you have any words for these people? I mean, like, um, you know, you need to see a nutrition expert, <laughs> you know? Um, well, it can be. I mean, because it's overwhelming, I think. I mean, like I said, you know, here's the big book on nutrition and who ha that's just over. You can start at page one and that's overwhelming. And that's why it often is really helpful to have an advocate to hold you accountable to making small changes right, and right. to break things down. Right. Because you don't have to do everything at once. Some people are like that. Some people are like, I'm changing my life for the end. You know, the cold turkey quit right. smokers who never yeah. go back. Um, <laughs> right. But not everyone is like that. And I think that it's important... My big thing that I chant to my clients is be kind to yourself. Mm -hmm. Be kind to yourself mm -hmm. and treat yourself like you would a four-year-old who came to stay with you. You know, you wouldn't buy right. that four-year-old right. um, corn syrup and soda. You want to give her something healthy. So think about the treats, finding treats for yourself that are truly treats, treats that feed you, that nurture your body, rather than treats that are just right. a quick fix right. that are right. going to be destructive in the long run. Right. Well, unfortunately, I think parents are feeding a lot of their four-year-olds the wrong foods because they're as big as their parents these days. But also, um, what do you think of this show, The I think it's The Big Loser, uh, where they go through this whole... It's one of those reality the, shows. Is it the weight loss show? Yeah, where they, they go through this whole thing for a certain amount of time. And, and it seems it must be a really quick amount of time, and they lose all of this weight. Um, I have heard that many of them immediately gain it right back. So are they doing the right thing or? I haven't seen the show, but I'll feel free to talk about it anyway. <laughs> I, um, I would think that, yeah, if you're put into an artificial environment, sure, you can lose some weight. But what I would hope those people are being taught is skills. Skills to integrate things one step at a time so that they own it when they leave the show And obviously that's not what they're being taught if they gain it all back immediately mm -hmm. But I know that there are programs like that and also TV programs that are mm -hmm. very successful I think Dean Ornish's model where he would go and put people on a very strict vegetarian low-fat mm -hmm. diet and he taught them lifestyle changes mm -hmm. and for the people for whom that diet worked they they were on it for life. He made he made it theirs. Right. So it's possible, certainly, right. to revamp in a, in an artificial set, right. setting and then take it home and own right. it. Right. But it doesn't sound to me from what well, you said that Well, it seems so successful. quick. You know, I mean, it happens. Yeah. I don't know how long it takes to film it, you know, or how long it takes for them to go through it. Uh, but it, I I know that I don't know if I heard on the news or what that you know so many or a lot of them gain the, the weight back almost right away. So I think they're not actually training them to go on a life yeah. long, uh, you know, type of, of fashion. But um, the, uh, the, uh, the um, type of nutrition that you practice, how long would it take uh, a person to go, to make a, a life change? That depends entirely on the person. Mm. It really does. Um, so do you mean like a, a major weight loss life change or just? Uh, yeah, I would say a, a weight loss life change where they don't go back. Mm -hmm. you know, with, uh, or is it, is it really possible? Or do you have to have a lot of willpower? You it know? is really possible. You have to be ready. Because I'm not, I'm not, uh, what's the word I want? I'm not forcing people to make changes. Right. So I am right. holding their hand and guiding right. them and helping them make the changes they want to make, make, but I'm not, if you want someone who's going to write out a meal plan for you and yell at you if you don't do, yeah. I don't do tough love. Right, right. Tough love, so right. I don't do that. Right. And right. it's really about kindness right. and learning to, right. for my clients to learn to be kind to themselves. So long-term change, lasting change is completely possible because I'm not forcing anything right. on them. And it depends on their motivation. And then. giving tools. Right. And so all right. these little changes they make add up right. to a massive amount of change over the course of six months. Six and months. then if they continue mm -hmm. to implement them, right. then it's a lifetime of change. So sometimes, you know, people eat for different reasons. Yes. They're depressed or they're happy or they've just lost a boyfriend or they're breaking up. Um, do you make suge suggestions in that area where you say, well, you know, this guy is no good for you. You've got to get rid of him or, you know. 
you've got to make not a dietary change, but you've got to make this lifestyle change. You can't keep going to this particular bar, you know, something like that. Do you give those type of recommendations? No, I don't do tough love. So, so it is not my business okay. to tell you who you should date or what bar you should go to. Mm -hmm. But I do give perspective, mm -hmm. you know, and sometimes just... I've had clients who've had massive revelations just by filling out mm -hmm. their initial health history form because they suddenly said, oh, this and this. Oh, you know, that's when that mm -hmm. started or this is when this mm -hmm. happens because they couldn't connect it before. So it really is giving perspective. Mm -hmm. I've had a number of clients who have changed jobs, mm -hmm. who have really shifted their Ooh. career around because they realized, oh, I'm really bored and unhappy at work and that's why I keep eating this and that's why I can't get enough sleep. And so... But I would certainly right. never say to someone, you're going to be quitting your job. Right, yeah, that's, right, not my, right. that's not my job. That's right. not my place at all. Right, right. But th that's very interesting. It's, it's what Freud calls the aha experience. You know, after so much therapy, all of a sudden they get it. Aha, that's why, you know. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so uh, you, you also, you don't do this full time, do you? Or do you do this full time now? Because I know. Business? Yeah. It's part time. I'm also in graduate school right now. Oh. And uh, I also do a bit of theater. Right. Uh, I know that you, you do uh, theater. Do you do just uh, theater or do you do film also? I did do film. I was a full-time actor before mm -hmm. I went back to nutrition school. Mm -hmm. So this, that was my premature midlife crisis. So <laughs> my, big, my big career change. I was a full-time actor before mm -hmm. that. I did mostly stage, but also some independent film and some commercials and a lot of voiceovers. Mm -hmm. So right now I'm just doing the occasional stage reading mm -hmm. because my plate is pretty full. Right, I can imagine that it is. And also um, you said that you're back in school and yes. you're in nutrition school? Or? I am in, I'm getting a master's degree in herbal medicine. Oh, wow. Now that's something that I am very interested in uh, because we, we try to do that at home, my son mm. and I. So can you speak a little bit about that? Or it's, I'm studying at the Thai Sophia Institute. Mm. It's in Laurel, Maryland. And they've been in acupuncture school for about 35 years, but the herbal medicine program is just about five years old. Wow. So it's very exciting to be part of a new program. And yeah. the program is merging together the traditions of herbalis or herbalism because there haven't been formal right. degrees, you know, accredited programs to study it. So it's taking right. the traditional um, diagnoses from, from India, from China, from Native American right. tradition, right. from the early turn of the century settler right. tradition, and all those sort of traditional right. diagnoses and, and ways of looking at patients and herbs and merging it together with science and the clinical trials that are going on. Right. So we're learning to read science and write, write scientific research while still looking at it from a truly holistic point of view. Well, that's interesting because if you're com combining like Chinese, Asian, and Native American herbs, does that work? I mean, does that work out? Uh, because there are, sometimes there are different, you know, reasons that you would use this herb and Yes. How and, does that work? Well, so, and the thing is that a lot of these traditions have already been merged. Because you had the sort of the Mediterranean sort of that merged into the Middle Eastern you know, thousands of years ago. And then some of those herbs came back and forth from India and China. And then when um, the Europeans came to um, the Americas, there was, so they brought some herbs with them. And they also learned from the Native Americans. And so there was a merging oh. and melding there. And so it's been, you know, each of these traditions mm -hmm. grew up pretty much alone, but then there has been certainly a lot of mm -hmm. mix and match over mm -hmm. the past couple well, that's of years. That's really, really interesting. And so you don't pursue your acting career anymore? Not so much anymore. So much I'm a company anymore. member at the Washington Stage Guild. They're my theater family, um, and I've been doing some stage readings with them, but I'm not auditioning at this time. Right, right. Well, that's, that's really, really interesting. Um, do you have anything that you would like to say to the people out there about nutrition, diet, I mean, there's a lot to say about it, but just, yeah. you know, to sum up. What's the most important? I think the goal, and I know that it's difficult with boxes and, and the supermarket full of boxes and bottles and crazy packaged things, but the yeah. idea of trying to eat things that are as close to the food that you would find in a field, you know? Mm -hmm. Does it look, where, 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 what is a Cheeto? Is that, what kind of food is that? You know, <laughs> but as opposed to an apple, you know? That the idea of trying to incorporate food that looks like real food, that it came from nature is right. a really wonderful place to start. Right, right. And uh, yeah, that's very true. And I think once someone 
starts eating, because um, I stopped eating meat when I went on a diet also, and I started veggies and salad, a lot of salad and fruits. And once you start eating those foods, you actually get such a liking for them that you don't go back to the other foods. Um, your palate changes. Your palate changes, your, your whole digestive system changes, yeah. and you actually like carrots, yes. you know? <laughs> you like to munch on a carrot like Bugs Bunny, you know? <laughs> So, well, I want to thank you very much for coming today. That was really interesting. Thank you. Um, and um, I think uh, if anyone would like to know more about um, Trisha's uh, Nutrisha Consulting, you can find her at her website, www.nutritiaconsulting.com. That's N U T R I. C I A C O N S U L T I N G dot com. It's a long word, it's all one word, but that's nutritionconsulting.com. Or you can email her at Trisha, T R I C I A, at nutritionconsulting.com. And uh, she has a phone number also, it's area code 202 812. Two, three, four, two. I think that's our show for today. Uh, I want to thank everyone who joined me, and I hope you will join me next time because on potluck, you never know what we'll dish up next. Thank you. Mm -hmm.